Uh, look, it's a pleasure being back here again. Um, it's always nice to come to a fellowship that loves and loves the Lord. Uh, Richard sent me an email and asked me to teach on the, you're going through the kings of Judah by the look of it. Uh, nice bunch. It was 19 of them. You know, and I've got the 14th, Manasseh. What a piece of work. Yeah. But, uh, there are some surprising things about Manasseh, which hopefully I'll be able to share with you. And uh, so I just want to read, uh, I'm going to be looking predominantly at Second Chronicles, chapter 33. You should be able to follow it, follow me through. I'm going to do more of a historical exegesis and hopefully toss in a little bit of theology and see what we can learn from a person like Manasseh. And, uh, so I'll just, I'm just going to read from verses 1 to 13. So Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and committed some horrible sin practices, practiced by the nations whom the Lord had drove out ahead of the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah destroyed, he set up altars for the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to the stars in the sky and worshipped them. He built altars in the Lord's temple, about which the Lord had said, Jerusalem will be my permanent home. In the two courtyards of the Lord's temple, he built altars for all the stars in the sky. He passed his sons through the fire in the valley of ben Hinnon, and practiced divination omen readings and sorcery. He set up a ritual pit to, co to conjure up the underworld spirits and appointed magicians to supervise it. He did a great amount of evil in the sight of the Lord and angered him. He put idolatrous image in the house he had made in God's temple, about which God had said to David and his son Solomon, this temple in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will be my permanent home. I will not make Israel again leave the land I gave to their ancestors, provided that they carefully obey all I commanded them. The whole law, the rules, and regulations given through Moses. But Manasseh misled the people of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem, so that they sinned more than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed ahead of the Israelites. The Lord confronted Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the commanders of the army of the king of Syria. They seized Manasseh, put hooks in his nose, bound him with bronze chains, and carried him away to Babylon. In his pain, Manasseh asked the Lord for mercy and truly humbled himself before God and his, of his ancestors. And when he prayed to the Lord, the Lord responded to him, and answered favorably his cry for mercy and brought him back to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh realized that the Lord is the true God. Let me just open in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, the truth of your word. Sometimes we are a bit confused about what you're trying to say to us. But Lord, you always want us to learn from you. And we pray this morning that you will give me the words so that we can all learn more about who your character is and the loving heart you have towards all people. In Jesus' name. If I was going to give this message a title, it would have been, Who Can Be Saved? You know, because in Second Chronicles 33, we're given a portrait of a king whose unparalleled evil sets him apart from all the other kings of Israel. But what also sets this king apart from the other kings, that such an evil king could also receive the transforming grace of God and get saved. The portrait in question relates to Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, the 14th king of Judah. 
It begins in verse 1, where Manasseh is said to begin his reign at the age of 12, which means he must have been born at least 12 years before Hezekiah, his father, died. Why is that important? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, Isaiah 38, verse 1, we're told that Hezekiah was stricken with a disease, and it was terminal. Isaiah, the prophet, told him to put his house in order because he was going to die. So Hezekiah came before the Lord tearfully and prayed, and God extended his life by 15 years. Hands up who wants their life extended by 15 years. I find it amazing. So about three years later, Manasseh would have been born. You think about this, the irony that without Hezekiah's prayer and God's intervention, I kind of wonder if Manasseh would actually have ever been born. You think about it, Hezekiah was supposed to have died. Manasseh was born during the extra 15 years that God had given him. And then he went on to be an absolutely disgusting king. Still trying to work out God's plan on that. Even as a young man, also living in the king's court, he would have heard the prophet Isaiah, who, by the way, was his maternal grandfather. And he preached the word of God, and he, and, uh, he would also have known that uh, Jerusalem was saved from Sennacherib's army when God wiped out the army in one night. So all that happened in those 12 years uh, in, during uh, the reign of Hezekiah. But even though he had all these godly influences, miracle birth, father, grandfather was a prophet and a king who was one of the godliest kings of all time, he still turned away. And you kind of think, what's going on? What did Hezekiah do? Did he fail? Well, the reality is that from my experience, lots of families, godly families, have bad sons or bad kids. Take your pick. The Bible is no different. If you look at uh, Joshua, his faithful generation was followed by an unfaithful generation. Samuel had two sons who didn't walk in the way of the Lord. David, a man after God's own heart, had two sons, Absalom and Ammon. Ammon raped his sister, and Absalom killed him for it. And finally, you have King Jotham, I think you might have heard of last week or the week before. For the most part, he reigned uh, uh, determined to please the Lord. But he had a son, Ahaz, who didn't want to please the Lord. So the truth is, as parents, we're responsible for praying and teaching our children and hopefully leading them to make a decision to, to live in relationship with the God. However, our faith doesn't save them. We can't. Nothing that we can do can save them. It, they have got to make their own individual prayer of repentance and move into that relationship with God on their own terms. In verse 2, and what I want to do here is just, with each verse I go through, is just take out some key words, which I think drives the verse. And so in verse 2, the portrait reveals the underlying character of Manasseh. Distinct phrase, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. We're not given an explanation of how Manasseh got to that point, given his background. But we do know from the writer with absolute certainty that Manasseh would pursue unparalleled evil, which God had condemned the nations in the land prior to them getting there. G.J. Chesterton once said, when a person stops believing in God, he doesn't believe in nothing. He will believe in anything. And it's exactly what Manasseh did. He cast aside his influences from, from his past, the godly influences. In verses 3 to 6, we can see that he rebuilt the high walls and the high places, I should say, his father Hezekiah destroyed, which in themselves were a threat to the centralized worship of God in the temple. The idea was to worship God in the temple, so, but he set up these places other than the temple, and uh, it devalued the worship of the temple. He also erected two altars in the courtyards of the temple in order to worship the gods Baal, who from the time of Judges through to the kings uh, was the principal threat of people's worship. If the people were going to get taken away 
uh, from God. Baal was probably the, the root cause. And someone will preach on Josiah in a couple of weeks. And that is the last you see of Baal. He does away with them and he never comes back. He also carved a pole which represented the god of Asherah. He bowed down to starry hosts. He worshipped them. He was so entrenched in his pagan worship and occult that he not only practiced sorcery and divination, along with consulting mediums and spiritualists, but he personally sacrificed his, his own sons in the fire, dedicating them to the god Moloch. Like I said, a real piece of work. The portrait of Manasseh's actions reveal a clear downward spiral. As all sin is, he went from false gods to fertility cults to astral worship and finally human sacrifice. And if you think that these practices were only committed in history past, just walk into one of your bookstores. You can go to these sections and call it religion. And there's everything you can get that is happening here you can read about and are encouraged. Uh, and uh, so those books still exist. And moving on, we, in tradition that had gone before, that's his, all these sinful acts, Hezekiah, uh, reforms were completely canceled. His voice of the prophets was silenced. And those who protested against uh, his policies were killed along with many other people. And his maternal grandfather was one of them. Tradition has it that he told Hezekiah to stop speaking. He didn't want to hear the word of the Lord anymore, and he banned him from speaking at all. And then eventually, tradition has it, he put him between two planks of wood, cut him in half. Who wants to live in that family? <laughs> but it was pretty bad. And the scripture goes on to say, he stained Jerusalem with their blood from one end to the other. The writer is particularly concerned about Manasseh's contempt for God's choice of Jerusalem. Being where he's put his temple, and as that is being his place of rest. And as we can see from verse 7, when he placed a carved image of the goddess Asherah into the house of the Lord, the idea was to bring back a ritual of sacred pro prostitution, actually in the temple of God. These acts were complete violation to Exodus 20, verses 3 and 4, where God directly commanded the people, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make yourself a carved image. In Psalm 115, verses 48, presents the ideas that idols are delusions simply because they're the product of human imagination and manufacture. We make them, and then we say, you're going to be our God. How ridiculous. Verse 5 to 7 points out that they have mouths but can't speak. They have eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear, noses that can't smell, hands that can't touch, and feet that cannot walk. He concludes the, in verse 8, those who make them will end up like them, and that everyone who trusts in them. The Chronicle is telling us that Manasseh and the people of Judah revered idols so much that they became like them. In other words, they became spiritually insensitive, and what they worshipped, they resembled, either to their ruin or to their restitu uh, restitution. We want to become more and more like the image of God. So what do we do? We read his word. We do all sorts of manners of things in life that we know that God requires us to do so that we can be that restored image that God intended us to be in the first place. If you worship an idol, you get the same result. And understand clearly that whatever your heart clings to or relies on for ultimate security, that's your God. The rich young ruler in Luke 19, his God was his wealth. Jesus told him to give it away, follow him. But no, he'd rather have his wealth than have a relationship with God. Today's society, we have new age religions that would tell you, you're all God's. You don't need God, you're God. An everyday person, consumerism, gives us all kinds of new idols to worship, such as the technology we constantly use. iPhones, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and a stack of others. Many people today completely rely on their online activity to give them a sense of identity. 
and know that they don't look to God for it. For others, it may be that their family is their God, their job, their sport, education, or status that they have in a social setting. For some Christians, it could be their worship of icons, saints, elements of the Eucharist. In some cases, it's even the cross and the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand me there, but the cross and the Bible is not our God, Jesus is. While others have traditions in the church which take precedence over clear teachings of God's work. Just in the last week, there's a split being in the Australian Anglican Church between those who, are wrong, who wrongly, I believe, see that gay marriage people should be included in the church. And then as those who rightly reject, I believe, it based on the contrary, it's contrary to God's word. So the church is split because people are not sticking to the word of God. Your idol is whatever claims your loyalty that belongs to God. If, that's, if God is your idol, your loyalty belongs to him. If you've got something else that's an idol, that, that, and that, that's, you'll give your loyalty to that instead of God. Paul offers us a way out where we are to bring every thought captive in obedience to Christ Jesus. And in doing so, I believe it would allow us to stand firm in the faith and not trust in idols. In the Old Testament, the fate of the people depended on properly seeking Yahweh through Jerusalem temple system. The temple was God's proclaimed permanent home and Manasseh and his people completely defiled it. So now in verse 8, Manasseh and his people are reminded of God's declared promises through his prophets that the temple was his designed dwelling place. He would not remove them from the land and he would bless them, but it came with the condition. They, would, they had to carefully obey all his commands. Verse 9 tells you, but they didn't listen. Now we can see the contrast between God's declared purposes and Manasseh's rebellious actions. As we're told, he misled the people to revere false gods and in doing so, reflected their spiritual blindness. We should know that it's likely that no king, including Manasseh, could have taken a nation that far down the rabbit hole in idol worship without the people's consent. So in verse 9, 10, Manasseh was warned. The Lord confronted Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. And as with all the other Judean kings, Manasseh and the plight of the people was entwined. The, the rebellion and disobedience in the form of idolatry, the lack of social justice on the part of the king brought divine ret retribution from God on both the king and his people. And we should know that the opposite is also true. Then when you've got godly kings like Hezekiah, it would bring God's blessings, peace, prosperity, and social reforms. Verse 11, so the Lord brought Manasseh to Babylon. In the process of disobedience, Manasseh and his people, they've abandoned their distinctiveness that made them unique to God, different from the world because they worship God. They had abandoned that, and in abandoning that and doing all the things that they did in the temple and the idol worship and all the rest of it, they literally gave up their right to occupy God's land, and the land that they were in was the land that God gave them. So it was God's land and also his temple. So they'd given up all those rights. And it was the beginning of the end uh, for Manasseh and his people. So God marshaled the forces of the Assyrians and put a hook in Manasseh's nose, bound him in chains, and carried him away to Babylon. In the end, Manasseh's actions, he had misled his people away from and took them away from the Lord. It was a path that it led them to their ruin. And although Manasseh was probably taken to Babylon due to some disaffection, and charges that he would have to answer, his fate was in God's hands, not the Assyrians. Some time ago, I was studying Isaiah, and I came across this idea that nations take actions without knowing they're actually fulfilling God's purposes and plans. Because God determines all things. If you look at Isaiah 44, I think it's verse 28 and 45, verse 1, 
Cyrus did what conformed to the will of God. He let the people go back to Jerusalem. But he also let other peoples that he'd captured during different wars to go back to their homes. It had nothing to do with the will of God. He was actually doing it for political reasons. They gave him a buffer between him and his other enemies. But it still conformed to the will of God. In verse 12, we see three little words. In his distress, there's nothing like being confronted by the results of your own choices. And as usually the case, a catastrophe will give you some great clarity and a discipline will give you discernment. Manasseh's end results of his decisions had caught up with him, taking him to a place he probably never thought possible. He was chained, bound, and shipped off to Babylon. And now he finally realizes why God brought judgment on him and the people. Stark reality of his decisions and the consequences had left him with just a couple of choices. He could continue to harden his heart from God and worship his idols, or he could humble himself before the living God and ask for grace and mercy. In Manasseh's choice of humility, we see how the transforming power of God's grace, extending mercy to a repentant king while in exile, for the Jews, they considered that the most extreme of all circumstances. Verse 13, Manasseh prayed and the Lord responded. They go together like a hand in a glove. We pray and God responds. It's interesting to note in two kings that the writer says nothing good about Manasseh and brands him as the worst king ever to sit in David's throne and whose sin was such that he could never be forgiven. You'll see that in 2 Kings 21, 9 to 15. And also Jeremiah, it's really stark in chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, where Jeremiah just absolutely condemns Manasseh uh, in ways that just incredibly stark. However, Chronicle doesn't see it that way. Manasseh is forgiven through prayer and humble repentance, just like all of us. Though it was God's listening to the prayer rather than Manasseh's act of prayer and it brought about his effective change. But how do you reconcile this? I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about this verse. And God was actually, I was off on another tangent. And God was actually telling me, you've gone in the wrong direction. What are you talking about? I said, will you tell me that you would save Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, and whatever, Jim Jones? Yes. You know, so he said, it's the centrality of the cross. You've missed the meaning of the, the verse. And so I kind of woke my wife up, three o'clock in the morning, guess what? <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> so to me, I, I still have trouble, rec I had trouble reconciling. How would God save such a rotten guy? I mean, a guy that I would have shot without hesitation. Now, Manasseh, he deserved nothing but condemnation because his life was so evil. Now he gets life? Are you kidding me? He deserves nothing, but now he's going to inherit everything. Why would God allow it? Well, the answer is really clear. Even though God had the right to wipe away Manasseh and his rebellion, and these rebellious attitudes, he chose another course, redemption. Because it's in the very nature of God to restore that which is lost. And this demonstration of sending his son to die for us so that God could reconcile us to him. And for, you know, the Romans says, but why were we yet sinners? It's actually enemies in verse 10. Christ died for us. In reality, our hope and the hope of all humanity in the state of, wretched state of affairs that we have is only God's redemptive mercy. And he is forming this. For example, when God was talking to Abraham, I'm just going to go down the road and I'm going to blow up Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm just going to let them have it. But God 
would have saved the entire city. The entire city, the whole population would have survived if he could have found 10 people there. 10 righteous people was all he required, and he couldn't find it. The second example is the city of Nineveh, where God has sent Jonah to tell him, I'm going to destroy you lot as well. And, uh, and the people heard it of Nineveh, and they repented. And so God relented from destroying them, much to Jonah's disgust. Martin Selman, in his commentary in 2 Chronicles, believes that Manasseh's conversion ranks alongside the experience of Saul of Tarsus, and that throughout Christian history, we find many other examples of God's grace, such as that of John Newton, uh, the slave trader. We must understand that even when we can't understand God, God will continually demonstrate to us that he can be trusted. And that his promises are the only ones of hope that we have. And he sets them before all these people. The narrative of Manasseh is not only about justice, but it's also about God's grace and mercy. And I read a thing some time ago that said, Jesus is far more merciful than we could ever imagine. And we all sit in this room as testimony to that. You know, we can point the finger at Manasseh, but God considered me a sinner and an enemy. And that's why he sent Jesus. And he did the same for all of us. The thing about Manasseh, it tells you that salvation, it's never too late. That a life wasted is wasted if we don't grasp and experience the transforming grace of God. The well-lived life must be God-exalting and so satisfying because that's why God created us. The Lord then brings Manasseh back to Jerusalem and he's restored him. Now, this was like a personal exodus and restoration, uh, although, like all sinners, it was an act of God that was completely undeserved. Now, Manasseh's sin is followed, although it was followed off by being carried off into other nations, being returned was like being restored, uh, a demonstration of God's uh, faithfulness to him. Second Kings shows the wickedness, shows that the wickedness of the nation led them into exile. While Chronicles it focuses on why they came out of exile through repentance. And exile, and now they're in God's favor. And with the reality of his repentance, exile now returned to the land. Manasseh himself recognized that the Lord is the true God, and there's no other. In verses 14 to 17, we can see that Manasseh's uh, repentance leads to reformation. And here we're seeing both structural and religious. In verse 14, he kind of re re fortifies the cities and fixes up the army. Verses, well, verses 15 and 16, he destroys all the places that he built. Everything he'd done in verses 2 to 9, all the things he'd set up to worship idols, he gets rid of that and he puts back in the high place. The problem with it, however, was that Manasseh couldn't carry out his reformation that anywhere near as well as he, he could carry out his corruption. The people continued to offer sacrifices at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. They'd compromised. They're spiritually bankrupt. They didn't care that God's temple was the place to do worship. They were still going to do it in the high places. The acts of worship were done as though the temple didn't even exist. So despite the religious reforms implemented by Manasseh, the people saw no need for a change of heart. And I guess you could say that it's an easy thing to pull something down and corrupt the hearts of people. And it's not so easy to reform them again. In verse 20, the final statement on Manasseh, many of the kings in that day were buried in the city of David in the plot reserved for heroes. In dying, Manasseh was not given such an honor. He had to be buried in his own garden of his own house. If going on to Amon, who became his, his um, heir, 
there's there's very little said about him on uh, but there's some interesting things about him on uh, similarities and contrasts he has with Manasseh to begin with we see that Manasseh's reign was the longest of the kings and Ammon was one of the shortest in verse 22 they both started out doing evil in the sight of the Lord Ammon like Manasseh was committed to idols unlike Manasseh Ammon didn't humble himself and while Manasseh repented in verse 23 Ammon increased his guilt and if there was any trace of Manasseh's reforms remained after his death Ammon soon removed it so while Manasseh died of an old age of 67 I should have been dead a year ago uh, <laughs> Ammon was assassinated at 24 and Josiah became a king in his place the one thing I have learned in this whole exercise is that it's never too late for salvation to come. And you're never too evil for God to extend his grace. It sounds, there's a lot of evil in the world today. And some of it's disgusting. We see it in the wars, which we're talking about there. In Ukraine in particular, uh, the Sudan's terrible. And, but God's grace, he's still willing to, pour out on all men so it's never too late even if you're praying for your son your daughter your granddaughter your husband your wife you keep praying and i'll finish with this george muller a man of great faith back in the 1800s i think he had two friends that he prayed for every day for 40 years every day for 40 years one became a christian just before he died uh, before Muller died and the other one became a Christian just after he passed away it's never too late thanks